Russian air defenses claim to have intercepted Ukrainian drones over several regions in Russia, including Moscow. And this comes a day after Kyiv reported the largest drone attack on Ukraine since Russia's invasion last year. As per Ukraine, Russia had launched over 70 drones at Kyiv, an act which Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has called willful terror. As per the Russian army, it downed two Ukrainian drones, missiles, pardon me, over the Sea of Azov. Meanwhile, Ukraine's counter-offensive, which began in the summer, it's continued with its forces at work trying to thwart Russian forces in the annexed Crimean Peninsula as the war drags on. What is the end game here? My name is Haim Korsaro and I'm being joined by Mr. Ben Aris, founder and editor-in-chief of BNE Intelli News and also former Moscow bureau chief for the Daily Telegraph to discuss this further. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. My pleasure. Now, sir, the Russia-Ukraine war, it continues to rage on. Fighting continues on both fronts. However, there hasn't been any significant development on the movement on ground. At this juncture, what's your take on how things have unfolded so far? Well, a top Ukrainian general called the war at a stalemate, that there was great expectations that this summer's counteroffensive would produce a sort of hammer blow against the Russian defences. But those defences, um, were the Russians were given like nine months to build them up, and they're very extensive. They've proven to be impenetrable, and so um, the fighting on the ground along the line, uh, there's been almost no movement at all over the summer, mere 16 kilometres, according to reports. And so now... Uh, um, the winter's setting in, um, the snows are coming, there's a huge storm going on in the Crimea, the worst in 100 years, um, and that storm is headed north and there's going to be blizzards, uh, snow hitting Kiev. And what's going on now is because there's no movement on the ground, that they're pounding each other with missiles and drone attacks. So as you mentioned, two days ago, uh, Russia's attempted to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses, which are very good now. But what they did is they sent 75 drones in one go, uh, hoping that the air defenses would be overwhelmed and they, um, the drones would get through. As it was, the Ukrainian air defenses managed to shoot down 71 of those. But those drones um, launched by Russia are clearly targeting power installations. And so the few that did get through hit power stations and caused sort of temporary blackouts. And what we're seeing now is the Ukrainians responding. Um, in like, they also have a lot of drones and they've been firing them back at Russia. And Russia too has invested heavily in its air defenses. And now the, the ground has become snowy and muddy, um, making uh, ground defenses very difficult. I think what we're going to see for the winter from this point on is uh, an exchange of drones and missiles. And Russia's tactics are going to be the same as they were last year. It's going to target power installations, heating installations, in attempt to plunge Ukraine into darkness and freezing cold temperatures and just undermine the morale of the people um, over the winter. You're absolutely right. The energy grid is being targeted in winter. It's only going to make operations more complicated in this regard. Now, Ukraine, as I mentioned and as you mentioned as well, it endured the largest drone attack. What would you say is Russia's plan in this war at this point? We also saw retaliatory strikes by Ukraine over Moscow and four other regions in which Russia downed Ukrainian drones as well. What is the plan here? Well, it seems to me that um, time is now on Russia's side in so much as the Ukrainians have gone from the defense of the first year, first year and a half, onto the offense. They've been pushed by their NATO allies to produce some sort of military result. And that's necessary in order to keep the funding for Ukraine's war effort going. However, the fact that the uh, counteroffensive didn't make any progress is a huge problem. And now we're seeing everyone talk about Ukraine fatigue. Um, the, the, the money is, is clearly drying up. The state's been unable to pass any more allocations and there are reports from Kiev this morning that they're starting to have problems with ammunition supply and I think that's Putin's plan he's just going to sit in bunker down defend the line um, grind away at Ukraine by constantly attacking it with drones aiming at critical infrastructure like the power and heating sector uh, in the hope uh, and not an unrealistic hope that the West are just going to get bored and stopped funding Ukraine and that Zelensky will run out of men and ammunition and be forced to capitulate or at least to enter into negotiations. And for the 
Russians, it should be um, pointed out that they're, they're sitting there, they're waiting for the result of the November presidential elections in, in America. There's a chance that Trump could come back. Um, that could be a game changer. And so Russia has no incentive at the moment to try and score an expensive victory in terms of ammunition, money and lives. Um, with a grand offensive, with a assault, military assault, that he's just playing for time to see what happens with the politics, mm. in the, in the hope that, that, that Ukraine will be forced to the negotiating table simply because it's under undersupplied. In fact, I was just going to come to this. So, what you're saying essentially is that this is a war of fatigue and attrition, and there are also concerns, however, that this focus seems to have shifted to Israel and Hamas war away from the Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine is calling for more weapon supplies. Do you think the two sides can actually sustain this war, especially as you mentioned as well, that winter months are here and that is going to be more challenging for the troops on the front lines? The White House has said that it can, it can supply both Israel and Ukraine. However, as I said, Kiev is reporting that um, supplies of the crucial artillery shells that are the main workhorse of what has turned into a war of attrition and artillery duel, uh, duel have fallen by 30 percent already. And the problem was is that the, uh, the U.S. maintained these huge stocks of artillery shells and sent Ukraine a million shells at the beginning of the war. But they haven't ramped up their production, and they actually only produce 100,000 of these shells a year. And so the stocks are already running low. I mean, they've been scrabbling around to find alternatives. They've replaced some of the shells with cluster munition, which are banned in many countries. But the decision to do that was just simply to give the Ukrainians something to fire. And that's the question, can they sustain two wars at once? And I think at this point, it seems that they can't, I mean, not fully supply both sides, because uh, Ukraine's already being squeezed uh, in the number of shells that it gets. And without those shells, they become vulnerable to the Russians, who are producing two million of these shells a year, and are simply you know, out, out gunning, out firing the Ukrainians by a factor of 10. And that's a problem. I mean, it, the, the Ukrainians can't keep this up forever. All right. Now, on that note, just talking about their arsenals as well, reports suggest that Russian military is using the multifunctional frontline MiG-35 fighters in Ukraine. At the same time, some experts say that it is likely that the MiG-35 will mainly be used for money-making export sales. What's your take on this? Well, from the Ukrainian perspective, Zelensky from day one has been calling for the NATO allies to quote-unquote close the skies. And the Ukrainians do not control the skies. And that's one of the reasons why the ground offensive is going so poorly, because, you know, standard strategy is to send in infantry, but give them air cover. And without that air cover, the, the Ukrainian soldiers are vulnerable. Um, the, the MiGs, uh, the Russian tech, I mean, it should have dominated the skies, and it hasn't. Surprisingly, it hasn't completely dominated the skies. Uh, nevertheless, um, the Russian Air Force have been playing a crucial role, and this has made the Ukrainians' life hell dealing with these air attacks. And in terms of Russian exports of arms, they've fallen dramatically because I think everyone was very underwhelmed by the power of the Russian machine. I mean, they made a big hoo-ha about their new Armata tanks. Um, which is supposed to be this ultra modern main battle tank that can um, that can challenge things like the German Leopard tank, which is one of the best tanks in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and it simply has not been seen on the battlefield. It's not played a role, and so Russian tech, Russian arms um, have not been very impressive, and that's going to affect sales. So, putting the the MiG-35 into the air or the the, the more advanced Sukhois that they have, the other fighter jet. Um, I, I think it's a, a marketing sales plan by the Russian side um, to supply these weapons. But as I say, the arms exports of Russia have already fallen dramatically because people have been unimpressed by the, uh, the quality of the tech that they've put onto the battlefield. Right. And finally, of course, the question that everyone has on their minds. Can, see, can we see a ceasefire anytime soon? Can peace be negotiated at this point? Uh, the two sides are very far apart, and I continue to think um, that there's no grounds, there's no common ground whatsoever. The Ukrainians are saying they won't start talks until all of the Russian soldiers have left 
all of occupied Ukraine, including Crimea, and that's not going to happen. And the Russian position is likewise that they're not going to come to the negotiating table until Ukraine first concedes Russian sovereignty over Ukraine and the four regions that it annexed in September. And the Ukrainians are adamant, not just Zelensky, the entire population are adamant that they're not going to give any territory away at all. And like I said, the key issue here is that there's no motivation for Putin to do any sort of ceasefire talk until the presidential elections in the states is passed because that by itself could bring the war to an end where Ukraine will be forced by its allies to uh, make serious territorial concessions simply to stop it. And so uh, I think everyone's going to sit around now for another year and we're going to see another atrocious year of this uh, attrition. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have already died. Hundreds of thousands more will die. Um, and there's no chance, I, I think, for a ceasefire in the short term. All right. Mr. Ben Aris, thank you so much for joining us on Beyond with your insights on this. Pleasure as always.